Good morning and welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Albany. We especially welcome visitors to our service. My name is Martha Deborah Bailey Brown and I am the service associate today. This morning we welcome to our pulpit David Weisbard. The Reverend David Weisbard was born into this congregation just after his parents, Al and Ramona, were introduced to the church by Ramona's doctor, Francis Vosberg, a pillar of the church and of the medical community here in Albany. During his high school years, Dave was president of our youth group and delivered his first sermon on Youth Sunday in 1958. I was part of that service. Our friendship obviously goes a long, from a long time ago. He graduated from Albany High School and went to St. Lawrence University in Canton, and then its theological school, of which he was the final graduate. Does that mean because your last name was with W? It was another W, W-E-I-D, and I'm <laughs> close. <laughs> the school closed. In the 41 years of his full-time ministry, he served at the first parish of Bedford, Massachusetts from 1965 to 74, the Fairfax Unitarian Church in Virginia from 74 to 79, and the Unitarian Universalist Church in Rockford, Illinois from 1979 to 2006. Dave was active in social justice throughout his ministry and served on de several denominational committees. Dave was married first to Linda Roberts of Delmar, with whom he had three daughters, Lisa, Shelley, and Meredith. Linda died in 1987, and he married Karen Wells in 1990, and they became the parents of Hillary. And uh, Shelley and Karen and Hillary are here today with us, as well as grandson Finn. When David retired from full-time ministry in 2006, he returned to Canton, New York. He now preaches the first Sunday of each month to the First Unitarian Universalist Society in Central Square, on the second Sundays to the Congregation of All Souls UU Church in Watertown. And we get to hear him once a year in this pulpit. Welcome. Olga. Uh, is a uh, hymn of hope is our prelude.
These words are from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Hatred and bitterness can never cure the disease of fear. Only love can do that. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. One day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. Our pastoral care associate today is Alice Schrade. Would you like to lead us in the, or shall I? Okay. Please join us in the uh, chalice lighting, which is printed in the order of your service, as well as on the screen. Welcoming all free seekers of truth and meaning, we gather to excite the human spirit to inspire its growth and development, to respond morally and ethically to a troubled world, and to sustain a vital and nurturing religious community. Our wisdom story today is Pete the Cat, I Love My White Shoes. Story by Eric Litwin and art by James Dean. Pete the cat was walking down the street in his brand new white shoes. Pete loved his white shoes so much. He sang this song. stepped in a large pile of strawberries. What color <laughs> did it turn his shoes? Red. Did Pete cry? Goodness, no. He kept walking along and singing his song. I love my red shoes. 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 Oh, no. Pete stepped in a large pile of blueberries. What color did it turn his shoes? Blue. Did Pete cry? Goodness, no. He kept walking along and singing his song. I love my blue shoes. 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 Oh, no. Pete stepped in a large pile, puddle of mud. What color did it turn his shoes? Brown. Did Pete cry? Goodness, no. He kept walking along and singing his song. I love my brown shoes. 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 Oh, no. Pete stepped in a bucket of water, and all the brown, and all the blue, and all the red were washed away. What color were his shoes again? White, but now they were wet. 
Did Pete cry? Goodness, no. He kept walking along and singing his song. I love my wet shoes. 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 I love my, I love my, I love my wet shoes. <laughs> the moral of Pete's story is no matter what you step in, keep walking along and singing your song because it's all good. And that is the end of our story. But let's take a moment to thank Olga for her participation in our story today. A reading is taken from the writings of James Luther Adams, who was the one of the outstanding liberal theologians of the 20th century. He suggested that religious liberalism has five fundamental principles, five smooth stones, as he put it. <clears throat> First, revelation is continuous, meaning that meaning has not been finally captured. Two, all relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not on coercion. Third, there is a moral obligation to direct one's efforts toward the establishment of a just and loving community. Fourth, the creation of justice in community requires the organization of power. And fifth, liberalism holds that the resources, divine and human, that are available for the achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate optimism. Here is more of what Dr. Adams wrote about optimism. This view does not necessarily involve immediate optimism. In our century, we have seen the rebarbarization of the mass man. We have witnessed a widespread dissolution of values and we have viewed the appearance of great collective demonries. Progress is now seen not to take place through inheritance. Each generation must anew win insight into the ambiguous nature of human existence and must give new relevance to moral and spiritual values. A realistic appraisal of our foibles and a life of continuing humility and repentance is all that will do, for there are ever-present forces in us working for perversion and destruction. Still, there is something in the genuine liberal perspective that while recognizing this tragic nature of the human condition, continues to live with a dynamic hope with the optative mood as one of its voices. The affirmative action and the affirmative answer of prophetic religion, which may be heard in the very midst of the doom that threatens like thunder, is that history is a struggle in dead earnest between justice and injustice, looking towards the ultimate victory in the promise and the fulfillment of grace. Anyone who does not enter into that struggle with the affirmation of love and beauty misses the mark and thwarts creation as well as self-creation. Thus, with all the realism and tough-mindedness that can be mustered, the genuine liberal finally can hear and join the hallelujah chorus, intellectual integrity, social relevance, amplitude of perspective, and the spirit of true liberation all offer no less. Here ends our reading. Of your time to justify my use of the word despair to describe a major element in our lives today. There are the threats to our environment, the proliferation of guns. There's the growth of racism 
anti-Semitism and anti-Muslimism, the deaths from drug use, the growing disrepute of our Supreme Court. And then there's the threat to democracy by the former and likely soon to be candidate for the presidency of our nation, a man who incited an insurrection to keep himself in office, who stands convicted of massive business fraud and sexual violence, and is now facing trials for 91 felony charges. This is a man who recently called for the execution of the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He has declared his intention to order mass deportations of all left-wing people, citizens and non-citizens alike. And he proclaims that the recent increase in whale deaths can be attributed to their having been driven crazy by windmills. I, he, he said it, I, I didn't come up with it. The Heritage Foundation has prepared what they call Project 2025, a blueprint for his use or for use by any other conservative Republican victorious in the 2024 election. They are proposing a policy by which the next president would be given absolute authority. Their 930 page plan calls for the firing of thousands of government employees to re be replaced only by people who swear allegiance to the president, eliminating climate change as any government concern, developing more fossil fuels, eradicating LGBTQ people from public life. This is serious and it goes on and it only gets worse. You know the old poster? Cheer up, things could be worse. So I cheered up and sure enough, things got worse. <laughs> Surely I don't have to go on further to persuade you that this is a time of significant despair. I suspect we all know some people who wake up each morning wondering how much worse today is going to be than yesterday. There are people who seem to be constitutionally disposed to anticipating the worst. Strange thing, they're infrequently disappointed. Should something pleasant happen to them, they know in their heart of hearts that that's only to soften them up for a really big blow to come. And so they accept good things with dread. Perhaps their greatest hope is that today won't be much worse than yesterday. Word pessimism is taken from the Latin root pessimus, meaning the worst. This is a philosophy that some trace to Schopenhauer, in which he proposed that ours is, in fact, the worst possible world, that sorrow is inherent in the human condition, and that we would probably be better off if we had not been born. The alternative stance is what we call optimism which comes from the Latin word optimus, meaning the best. The word was coined by the philosopher Leibniz, who insisted that since God is good, he would have created the best world he could imagine. And since this is the world we have, it must be the best possible, even if it doesn't always look that way to us. As Jim Adams pointed out in our reading, religious liberals have always tended to be optimistic. Optimism is, in truth, central to our culture. The religious perspective of what we refer to as Western culture has emphasized a linear history, beginning in chaos and moving inexorably toward order, beginning in sin and moving onward toward purity. Jews, Christians, and Muslims have envisioned a world in which progress was a central concept. They teach that we are moving toward a kingdom of God. Judaism has emphasized a worldly kingdom of justice, which will be ushered in by the arrival of the Messiah. Christians have been a bit mixed on this, some emphasizing the return of the Messiah to this world, since they believe he was already here in the pers person of Jesus and others suggesting that the holy kingdom will not be of this world, but really is about another world to which the good 
the believers will once go after they have passed through this veil of tears. For religious liberals, the emphasis has been very much on this world and not on another, and on the achievement of a better world through human effort rather than through supernatural intervention. A traditional Unitarian affirmation asserted belief in the progress of mankind, onward and upward forever. In the post-World War II years, this saying generally fell out of favor. The horrors of Nazism made human progress more dubious. People began to wonder how far from the jungles we have actually moved. Some of us would include the barbaric bombing of Hiroshima to challenges of that rosy view of human improvement. Jim Adams was, in a sense, a modern liberal. He was willing, as our reading indicated, to acknowledge that progress was not simply a straight line upward. He did not, as some liberals do, deny the reality of the challenges to progress, the detours. But when it came right down to it, Jim was a loyal believer. He insisted that history had an ultimate direction and that we were moving to a better time, maybe with some detours along the way. Optimism is the philosophy that Voltaire attacked in his little comic novel, Candide. Candide was taught by his tutor, Dr. Pangloss, a disciple of Leibniz, who believed that this is the best of all possible worlds. Candide is expelled from the household of the Baron, whose unmarried sister is Candide's mother, for having kissed the Baron's daughter. Candide is impressed into the army, deserts, is shipwrecked, beaten as a scapegoat, and kills two men who had abused his beloved. Higher and higher, the misfortunes are piled up while Candide continues to go around clinging to the notion that this is the best of all possible worlds. In the end, Candide finally settles down on a small farm, marries his beloved, who has in the meantime become unattractive. Candide comes to the conclusion that the best one can do is to cultivate one's own garden. Voltaire was attacking optimism, ridiculing it. But there is a sense in which, whether he saw it or not, he anticipated the modern findings of psychology. The fact is that Candide survived all those misfortunes to end up with a satisfactory life. Psychology suggests that had Candide been a pessimist, he might not have survived. He might have been overcome, paralyzed by despair, as so many people are. There have been a number of studies of groups of people which have tried to determine the roots of success in life. IQ is not a good predictor. College board scores are not good Victors. A long-term study of high school valedictorians in Illinois showed that high school success was not really a good predictor of life success. The one seemingly reliable cor correlation is between optimism and success. That doesn't mean that life goes totally smoothly for optimists, for they are not free from adversity, but that optimists seem to come through adversity more successfully than do pessimists. If optimism is so important, where does it come from? For a long time, people believed it was genetic, or at least the product of the earliest years of life. The psychologist Eric Erickson suggested that we, in our psychological development, go through eight stages, the first of which, the struggle between basic trust and basic mistrust is the foundation for all of the emotional developments that follow. It is the earliest interaction with the mother, her sensitivity, her responsiveness to the baby's needs, or the lack thereof, that result in the trust alternative. If one starts life with a basic mistrust, it is difficult, not impossible, but difficult 
to achieve positive outcomes later. We have begun in recent years to acknowledge that our view of the world is profoundly affected by our place in it. Our view of how good the world is is affected, not fully determined, but affected by our family's social class, by the color of our skin, by our gender, by our education, by our religious affiliation. It is easier to be optimistic in our culture if you are wealthy, white, male, college educated, and Protestant. Now that is not to say that everyone with those attributes pulls it off, but it is far easier to be optimistic under those circumstances than if you were, for instance, born to a black single mother who lives in poverty with several children or the child of one of them. The fundamental ways in which we view the world are far from objective. We all wear cultural glasses that actually impact what we see. Unitarian Universalists do not represent a cross-section of our society. We have the highest average educational level of any religious group except Hindus. And we are high in terms of average family income. And there's a lot about our lives that supports optimism. The truth is, however, that we are now much less optimistic than we used to be. I would suggest we have removed our blinders, or at least that we have widened our field of vision. We have moved beyond a paternalistic or maternalistic concern for those less fortunate to a growing realization of the relationship between our privilege and other people's deprivation. We have begun to look at history from perspectives other than just that of the dominant group. James Cabrell suggested that the optimist proclaims that we live in the best of all possible worlds. And the pessimist fears that that is true. I'll give you a minute. To... <laughs> We've begun to see the world as a very complex, complex place in which to live. We have lost the luxury of seeing pure good and pure evil, a simple struggle between justice and injustice, between those in white hats and those in black hats as being descriptive of our reality. When one explores the contemporary psychological writings on optimism, as I have, the research done by Martin Seligman, a native of Albany, is central. He's uh, two years younger than me. He went to Albany Academy. I went to Albany High School. The day Seligman began graduate school in psychology, the head of his department was engaged in experiments with dogs, experiments that were failing miserably. The goal was to see if one group of dogs whose feet had been mildly shocked by the metal grid on which they were standing at the same time that they heard a tone would leap over a low wall to a place of safety when they just heard the tone and didn't have to feel the shock. The problem was all of the dogs just laid down, even if they were shocked. Seligman had an idea. The dogs, having been subjected to random shocks, had become helpless. They had no control over what was happening to them, so they just lay down and took it. When Seligman redid the experiment, giving the dogs the ability to stop the shock by pushing a panel with their noses, it worked. The dogs that had a means to have some impact on what happened to them took evasive action by leaping over the barrier. A similar experiment was done with rats who were thrown into a tub with a milky liquid in it. For some of them, there was an island under the liquid on which they could stand if they found it. For another group, there was no rest. Those whose experience gave them hope that there might be a place to rest, swam twice as long without giving up as those who had no such hope. Seligman discovered that the same thing was true when his students began experimenting with people. No, they didn't shock them or throw them into milky liquids, 
but they did subject them to unpleasant noises that some of them could control and others could not. Those who had no control acted as helpless as the dogs, while those who had experienced control applied that control. Seligman reported that our satisfaction was quickly replaced by fierce curiosity. Who gives up easily and who never gives up? Who survives when his work comes to nothing or when she is rejected by someone that she has loved long and deeply? And why? Clearly, some people do not prevail. Like helpless dogs, they crumple up. And some do prevail, like the indomitable experimental subjects. They pick themselves up and with life somewhat poorer, manage nonetheless to go on and to rebuild. Sentimentalists call this a triumph of the human will or the courage to be, as if such labels explained it. It was clear to us, said Seligman, that the remarkable at, uh, attribute of resilience in the face of dis defeat need not remain a mystery. It was not an inborn trait. It could be acquired. The title of Seligman's major work is Learned optimism. As he continued to explore the differences between those who gave up readily and those who persisted, he came to believe that two of the key differences were, one, the experience of having control, and secondly, how one explained misfortune to oneself. There are three dimensions to what he called explanatory style, permanence, pervasiveness, and personalization. Permanence has to do with whether one believes that the bad stuff that has happened to them will always be there and can never be overcome. It has to do with time, with duration. Pervasiveness has to do with extent. If you fail at a job, does that mean that you are entirely worthless or just that you failed in one area and you need to try something different? There are people who when a marriage fails, begin to fail at everything else. They see one failure in a universal context. Personalization has to do with whether you blame yourself or you blame others or circumstances for your failure. Now this is the trickiest one of the three because there's a sense, I think, in which it, pro it promotes irresponsibility. There are times when we are responsible for a failure, and we ought to admit it rather than blaming it on others. The dimensions of Seligman's theory that I find unacceptable is his insistence that we should take personal responsibility for all of our successes and blame others or circumstances for our failures. Similarly, in permanence, he wants us to believe that our successes are permanent and our failures are all transient. Our successes would, in his view, should be judged as meaning that it is a good world and our failures should be considered in a very limited context. Now, Seligman, like a good psychologist, developed a quiz to measure optimism based on his theory. Since I, for instance, globalize my failures at, 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 at athletics by saying I am not athletic, rather than just that I'm not good at baseball, golf, football, basketball, volleyball, tennis, track, <laughs> swimming, and every other sport yet discovered by humankind, and that I probably never will be, counts against my optimism score because I have universalized against myself and attributed permanence to my condition. And it's checked out pretty well. Uh, the fact that I believe that some of my failures are actually my fault means that I am, in his context, somewhat pessimistic. And so when I took Seligman's quiz on measuring optimism, I came out actually pretty much in the middle. But when I took other uh, tests that, that other psychologists had developed, I came out as an extreme optimist. So it just goes to show you something. <laughs> I, 
I do not take issue with Seligman's basic theory, but the extension of it demands a kind of inconsistency that I find personally intolerable. I'm not saying it doesn't work. Seligman is able, by use of his test, to predict who will be good insurance salespeople. The ability to keep on selling when 90% of your potential customers say no requires the kind of extreme optimism that Seligman looks for, which I would call a degree of blindness, uh, but that doesn't lead me to dismiss his work altogether. The point of Seligman's work is that he has found it possible to help people who were pessimistic to become significantly more optimistic. People who felt doomed to a life of failure have come to experience and even enjoy success. What it requires is for those who are pessimistic to realize that their attitude has a direct impact on their actions and to understand that their attitude is in fact self-defeating and can be changed. It isn't a matter of avoiding adversity, but very much a matter of what we do with it, how we choose to respond to adversity, like Pete the Cat's accidents with his shoes. He found a way to transcend the downside. Seligman acknowledges there can be very little doubt about it. Optimism is good for us. It's also more fun. What goes on in our head from moment to moment is more pleasant. But optimism is not a panacea. Optimism's benefits are not unbounded. Pessimism has a role to play, both in society at large and in our own lives. We must have the courage to endure pessimism when its perspective is in fact valuable. What we want is not blind optimism, but flexible optimism. Optimism with its eyes open. We must be able to use pessimism's keen sense of reality when we need it, but without having to dwell eternally in its dark shadows. Now, there is, of course, a middle ground between optimism and pessimism. George Eliot came up with the term meliorism, which is taken from the Latin melior, which means better. It makes the judgment that the world is in fact a mixed bag with good and evil, but it does assert that human beings have the ability to shift the balance. We are not powerless. Edmund Burke once said, nobody makes a greater mistake than one who does nothing because all he or she could do was a little. Let me say that again. Nobody makes a greater mistake than one who does nothing because all he or she could do is a little. Meliorism is defined by some as a belief that society has an innate tendency toward improvement and that this tendency may be furthered through conscious human effort. My understanding of the term is in fact a little more modest than that. Do I believe that human society has an innate tendency toward improvement? No, it, the truth is I don't. As I look at human history and at the present, as, as objectively as I'm able, I find uh, little, limited, dramatic progress. But that is not to say that I see no progress. It's the challenges to us that remain real. One of the things that we need in times of stress or times of despair is inspiration or support from others whose optimism may be burning a little brighter at those times when ours are, are, is dimmer. The name of that support is community, a group of people to whom we offer support and from whom we receive it. For most of us, I believe, community is essential to helping us to maintain balance between the poles of optimism and pessimism. Earlier, I spoke of Can Voltaire's Candide. Candide's teacher kept insisting that he was living in the best of all possible worlds, while every day something worse was happening. In the end, Candide decided that the best he could do is to devote himself to making his garden grow. There's a sense in which this is an appropriate melioristic message. You can't do it all, 
So commit yourself to doing what you can do. Cultivate your own little corner of the earth. You produce something good and you do no harm, depending of course on the fertilizers that you use. But there's still a problem there because as much as we might like to retreat to our own little gardens, there is a larger world out there. How can we be secure while others are denied gardens, while others pollute the air or the water? You can't withdraw into a shell and just try to do no harm. That is not sufficient because our responsibility is larger than that. We are part of a human community upon which we depend and which depends on us. See, I take inspiration from people like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Cassidy Hutchinson, Liz Cheney, Greta Thunberg, Rosalind Carter, uh, Malala Yousafzai, people in different countries who were determined to do what they could and who have made a difference. I'm also lifted up by people in my community who have dreams similar to mine who are there when I get discouraged, and I do. So what do we do? We do what we can. We cannot do it all. We cannot do anything truly significant alone, I would maintain. The inspiring people I mentioned all worked with others. One of the things that I believe draws people to Unitarian Universalism is that we do care about this world, this life. We try to be responsible to do what we can to make it better. We do not live in a world that is perfect, nor are we likely to live to see such a world. This is a world with much injustice and exploitation, but the dream of love and justice has not been, and I believe cannot be, extinguished. That dream may be irrational, but it lives on, and it has the power to shape our lives if we will let it. It is important that we appreciate what opportunities life gives us and accept the responsibility of doing what we can to add our measure of caring and energy to making this the kind of world of which the prophets have sung. I, I have a, a favorite contemporary prophet. Uh, his name is John Pavlovitz. He's a progressive Christian minister. Has anybody encountered his writings? He's, he's on the internet. Uh, this week, after I had announced this sermon, and, and it was mostly written, he posted this, a blog that was relevant to this morning. And this is the conclusion. I don't have time for the, the whole blog, but this, this is the conclusion of it. Hopelessness, he writes, has never made the world more safe or just or beautiful, and it is of no use right now. Anything else we can work with. Anger can re be redirected into something productive. Outrage can be channeled into a useful response. Grief can be transformed into goodness. In days like this, he says, nothing helpful can come from resignation. The first step and the greatest victory today is simply in seeing that yes, good people still inhabit this place and that you are one of them. And that's where hope is. Take a look in the mirror, friend, he says. See the grief on your face, feel the full depth of your sadness, and be encouraged by it today. Hear your heartbeat and know that while that is happening, so much is still possible. Keep moving, keep working, keep helping to hell with helplessness. Amen. And so our hymn. I left my order of service over there is number. Oh, it isn't time for the hymn yet. I, I expect the hymn to follow immediately, and it doesn't. Um, in fact, uh, this is the time for prayer and meditation. Shall we join together in silence?
Now may the truths that make us free, the hope that never dies, and the love that casts out fear lead us and those we love and those whom nobody loves forward together until the day spring breaks and the shadows flee away. Amen. And now, as um, I'll say Marty uh, shows my age, but Martha Deborah <laughs> extinguishes the chalice. Can we join in the words in the order of service? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together. Thank you, Pam. Oh, thank you. Thank you.